you want to follow along, I'll be reading out of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. While it's true that Jesus came as a baby, he grew into an adult. And the real purpose for his coming was realized. Our next scripture reading is from Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, uh, our beloved Savior. And so we celebrate not only uh, the birth of Jesus, but we celebrate the coming of our Savior. And we'll do that from the reading of Isaiah 53 and the song, Salvation Belongs to the Lord. Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We, all like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own ways, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. He poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Within hours, within hours, he would be dead. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. On the Mount of Olives, Jesus was in agony there. On the Mount of Olives, he prayed, if there was any other way, let this cup pass. But there was no other way. On the Mount of Olives, he was taken captive. He was then brought before a trial of one kind or of another, and then another. And finally, the sentence was issued, death by crucifixion. Matthew 27, two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right side and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads, and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. 
And in the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders, they mocked him. He saved others, they said. But he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he wants him. For he said, I'm the son of God. And in the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and when some of those standing near heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and, and got a sponge, and he filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a staff, and he offered it to Jesus to drink. And the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks split. And tombs broke open. Let's join together and sing of the wondrous cross. The Lord's table. You don't get to just sit here because you want to. It is no small thing to sit at the Lord's table. There is a depth of commitment required. Because we look across this table during during that song I, I looked across the table and saw my wife and I thought man what a joy it is to have had my wife beside me for so many years at this table. And I see her through the blood and, and the body of Jesus. You know, it is a genuine delight to see our family across this table, isn't it? You know, I, I, I can see Macy here, but I also have other children who are grown who are away from here. And it is a genuine, to del, it is a genuine delight to know that they are feasting at the same table today. But that's the easy ones. It's easy to sit across the table with someone you love and you care about and you enjoy being around. But it's not so easy with somebody with whom you've had difficulty to see them through the cross of Christ to let that cross be the lens of our spiritual glasses. When we do that, it seems to destroy the anger that we feel. The words of hurt spoken behind our back, the whispers and maybe the looks that seem so unfair. Um, this table prepared before us seems to destroy even our own self-righteousness. For the cross works not only as a lens where we see God. It works not only as a lens that as we see other people, it also works as a lens as we see ourselves. It's a mirror. So even as we see others, we see ourselves through the eyes of the cross and we are humbled. 
Church, we are humbled. And also, you know, in John chapter 6, when Jesus was describing what it meant to be a follower of his, uh, he never said it was going to be easy. I have down here, he never said it was going to be a piece of cake. For some of us, we'd say a piece of pie. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he said, If any man come after me, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And in John 16, verse 33, In this world you will have trouble. And so back in John 6, Jesus is teaching becomes really difficult okay he starts teaching things that are that are difficult to understand so much so that it says in verse 66 from this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him so i'm trying to place in your mind that it's true sometimes jesus's teachings get so difficult for us to follow that we quit Jesus asked the 12 in verse 67 of John 6, You do not want to leave too, do you? And I, and I love the response. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Church, there is no other table to sit at, as bad grammar that is. There's no other table. You're either at the Lord's table or you're not. You're either with him and his church or you're not. And you know what? I cannot become angry at the one who sits across from me and say, you know what? I'll just go somewhere else and eat at the same table. I'll, I'll go feast somewhere else. Church, there is nowhere else that you're not at the same table, right? But this difficult teaching in John 6, we just know that people wouldn't put up with it, and they left. Jesus asked the twelve, are you going to leave too? And their answer was, where else are we going to go? In other words, there is no other place to go. Because you have the words of eternal life, and we believe you are the Holy One of God. At this time, we're going to actually sing about our trust in Jesus. And then after the song, we will participate together at the Lord's, <clears throat> at the Lord's table in sweet communion. I need a I need a volunteer. Kevin. Yeah, why don't you volunteer? God must be the focus of our worship. I get that. God must be the focus. We come together to worship God. Um, when our body comes together, we cannot, though, ignore each other. We can't. There's too many, too many statements in Scripture that, that say that we even, even our songs are to exhort and encourage each other. They are, they are to uplift and build up each other. So while there is the most important aspect of our worship from us to God. There is also a horizontal aspect to our worship uh, and even to the Lord's Supper. And I say even to the Lord's Supper because the Lord's Supper is something that we gather to gather to do. In 1 Corinthians 11, the church gathered to celebrate the Lord's Supper, but it, it became a mockery uh, be because of their treatment of other Christians. Uh, the way they treated their brothers and sisters in Christ from 1 Corinthians 11 had uh, a factor upon the worthiness of their worship. It also reminds me of 
Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, which tells us don't, don't skip, don't miss the meeting together of the saints as some people are in the habit of doing. Okay, it's important that we gather together because we have a responsibility uh, to encourage each other. We have the responsibility toward uh, love and good deeds for each other. So the horizontal aspect of worship is clear in Hebrews as well as in 1 Corinthians 11. So um, as we take, as we have taken the Lord's Supper, we understand that we're all members of the same church. We, all, we are all members of the body of Christ, if I can put it that way. If we are Christians, then we are united in Christ. He is our head, and all Christians are united to one another in the one body, and that's found in many other places in Scripture as well. With this understanding, uh, this understanding of our union in, in Christ, uh, we have a union with each other, and that is to result in mutual love and fellowship all to the glory of God. Church family, God is not ignorant of our relationships with one another. So I did have a run in with one of the ministers in one of the places where I worked. Okay, that was here. I've only worked here. Yeah, that's true. Okay, it was Kevin. You know, Kevin's got this stuff going on in his life, this personal stuff, and I found out about it. And I gave him all this really good advice. You know what he did? He didn't take it. What kind of person would not take the advice that I so happily just walked over his office and gave him? He really, I don't think, gave it very much attention. He don't think he even, well, he certainly didn't come down to my office, which he should have. That's what he should have done in the first place. But I had to walk all the way down to his office. I gave him the advice, and he didn't take it, and that makes me mad. And I know what scripture says in Matthew 18. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point it out to them. Just between the two of you. Oops. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of one or two three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen to you, tell it to the church. So, uh, Kevin, let's just settle this right now. So, uh, hello. Why didn't you take my advice? It was awesome. It's almost like you said, you don't even know what you're talking about. And I do, obviously. We're really doing this right here, right now? You know I always love you. But right now I just don't like you. You know, different people have different styles. And even if you have good advice, doesn't mean I have to take it. I appreciate that he said good advice. We're going to take a vote in a little bit and, you know. Why would you not take good advice? That just doesn't even sound smart. You know what I'm saying? So, not only do I have good advice, I mean, I have excellent advice. And you probably could ask a lot of people out here about it because it's pretty good. So, you need to apologize and, you know, ask me for forgiveness or something. Grovel. Ain't happening. Look, again, we have different styles. Just because you have a different opinion than me doesn't make my opinion wrong. And I can handle it as long as I handle things in a godly way. I don't have to do everything you tell me to. And so uh, this is really ridiculous that we're doing this here now in front of everybody. Um, I, I, <laughs> I can't handle it. 
maybe it's you can't handle it when I tell you this in private, so you had to bring it up here in front of everybody. And this is re- I, this is really ridiculous. Re- I can't even talk. You got me so frustrated. I can't even talk. You're being re- you're being ridiculous. I did because I also have thoughts of my own that aren't terrible. You're not the only one who has good ideas. Newsflash. Okay, it was probably obvious that we kind of made that up. The truth is, I can sit in my seat in this auditorium and partake of the Lord's Supper and be very, very angry at somebody who is also sitting at this same table, but they're like way over there. And for all practical purposes... I'm not taking the Lord's Supper with them. We just happen to be in the same room. But it would certainly be very difficult for me to sit here on one side of the table and for that person that I'm angry with to sit here across this table, having to look across the fruit of the vine and across the bread which represents the body of Christ and for me to imagine the Lord sitting here as well can you imagine that can you imagine Jesus sitting there and then and then taking the cup and and handing it to Kevin and say drink this this is the cup of the new covenant and then, and then taking it back and then handing it to me and saying, Scott, drink this. Eat this. I would have to contemplate very seriously about what it means to come together and partake in the Lord's Supper. I'd have to think really hard about what it means to be part of his body to be one in Christ. And I would have to work on my heart. You know, I know that the early church at the very beginning started out bigger than this church at this place has ever been. 3,000 were added to the church that first day. And I can imagine that when one of them partook of the Lord's Supper, that there could easily be others that were partaking that they might not ever see. And they may not ever uh, have anything to do with on any given Lord's Day. But that doesn't mean that the unity between I and thee is not as real as if we were sitting across the same table together. Because if I can't sit across the table from you and partake of the Lord's Supper together, 
it's probably because I have found something bigger than the Lord's table. It's probably because I have not found in Christ something big enough to overcome my differences and my difficulties with you. It would be as if I could sit down at this table and say, Lord, that's pretty good. Your death is good, but it's not good enough. Friends, too often we have let other things be bigger than the Lord's table. Maybe you have allowed your own wants and desires, your own cares of this world to keep you from becoming a Christian. Friend, repent of that and turn to Jesus because he is the savior of this world. There is no other. Right now, today, be baptized into Christ, having your sins washed away, and let God add you to the church. But others of us, we may have allowed our own desires to drown out the significance of this table. We have, may, we have maybe let our own emotions and frustrations been allowed to drown out the significance of his sacrifice, of his death. And maybe we've allowed our own hurt and bitterness, our own anger and rage, our own disappointment and sadness to interrupt this feast. You may have caught it because you just have gone somewhere else. You may have caught it because you sit on the other side. But you found and figured out that you may have allowed your pain to trump his pain. You, you've may, you maybe have allowed your suffering because of how you've been treated to trump his suffering. If this is you... And Justin, you might want to go ahead and come on up. If this is you, then this is what you need to know. Jesus knows when you're lonely. He knows each pain. He sees each tear. He understands each lonely heartache. He understands because he cares. Let's stand and sing together.